Hello and welcome to the David Icke Dot Connector video cast from the iconic studio in Derby, England. Well, I'm going to talk today about the brain and the two hemispheres of the brain. And the reaction might be, well, that sounds boring, Dave. Uh, what's that got to do with conspiracy? What's going on in the world? What's happening? Well, actually, it's fundamental to all of those things. I've been saying for decades that human society is a left brain prison. And because of that, the world is as it is. Because the two hemispheres of the brain have very different ways of processing information. They have very different personalities, if you like. And if you're locked away in the left side of the brain, then you are basically focused on myopia, the parts, whereas the right brain is seeing the panorama. It's connecting the dots. And if you are not influenced significantly by the right side of the brain, then to you, everything is random. Nothing's connected when, as the right brain knows, everything is connected. So before I get more deeply into this, here's an explanation of how the two hemispheres see the world and process information. Your brain is two brains, two hemispheres, each doing half the work of being you. Half your vision goes to each and half your movement directed by each. Right controls left and left controls right. Your two brains coordinate through a wire of nerves, but this wire can be cut and was, for a time, used as an epilepsy treatment. After the cut, people seemed the same, though their brain was split in twain. Except some post-split patients described that while selecting their morning outfit with right hand, left might come along to disagree. Actually, left hand might quite often disagree, which these split brain patients found frustrating. What's happening? To investigate, remember, right brain sees and controls one half, while left brain controls and sees the other. But only left brain can speak. Hello. Because and that's where the speech center is located. Right brain without this is mute. In normal brains, this doesn't matter because each half communicates across the wire with the other. But split brains can't, and thus you can show just the right brain a word, ask the person, what did you see, and you'll hear nothing. Because left speaking brain saw nothing. Meanwhile, right brain will use its hand to pick the object out of a pile hidden from left brain. This is deeply creepy. Ask why are you holding the object and speaking left brain will make up a plausible sounding but totally wrong reason. I always wanted to learn how to solve one of these. Left brain isn't lying, it's just doing what brains do, creating a story that explains its past actions to its current self, a behavior which does rather cast doubt onto the notion of free will, but that's a story for another time. Creating reasons for why it does things is just something left brains do. It happens in normal, healthy humans all the time, and if you think about it closely, you know you've done this. Back to experiments. Give right brain an object, ask the person what's in your hand, and they won't be able to say. I'm not holding anything. And when asked to draw, a split brain can draw two separate objects simultaneously with each hand in a way unsplit brains find challenging. These experiments on split brain patients are deeply unsettling because they really point in the direction of a mute, separate intelligence something living in the skull. You can even ask questions of a split brain and get disagreement on the answer. So if your brain is split, who is the you in this situation? So who is you? Well, it's consciousness. It's not the brain, it's consciousness. But if consciousness is not involved in the manifestation of perception, then it is the brain. It is the body. Why? Because what I'm saying is the brain and the body are, in effect, a software program. They are running a perception program, which if it's not overridden by consciousness external to the body, then 
the program is running your life. From the moment you enter this world to the moment you leave, the body program is dictating everything. We think we're having our own thoughts, we're forming our own opinions, when in fact, the program's doing it. This is why so many people in the 8 billion humans act the same and perceive the same. It's why it's so predictable. The unpredictability comes when consciousness overrides the program and goes its own way. So who is the you? It's consciousness. And some photographic techniques can visualize lower levels of consciousness called the auric field, but potentially consciousness for all of us expands into infinity. The problem with human control is that if people did that, they would be uncontrollable. So the whole system is designed to create a myopia of perception, of possibility, of personal potential, because then they got you. And that brings us to the left side of the brain, the prison cell. The left side is the myopia. And there's not a problem with that unless that's the only perception and information processing that dictates our lives. Because it's looking at the parts, the, the, the little bits and how they fit together. Whereas the right brain is looking at the connection of um, everything. Now, look at the institutions of state in every country. Look at the scientists, most of them with honorable exceptions. Look at academia, my God, look at academia. Look at the media. Look at corporations and that whole corporate world. And what are you looking at? People who overwhelmingly see the world from the perspective of the left side of the brain. And that has created the, the prison cell society that we live in. So all those people that laughed at me were left brain prisoners. When you're connecting dots and the left brain is not a dot connector, can only see random parts, well, you're going to look at someone connecting the dots and you're going to say, you're mad, mate. And then you look at education. What passes for it? Look at what children and young people are taught, are bombarded with, through all the formative years of their life, left brain information and left brain perspective. An accident, no chance. So the ideal is to be whole brained, where you have both hemispheres contributing to a balanced perception. You see the small and you see the infinite. And there's a bridge between the two hemispheres known as the corpus callosum, which is supposed to um, communicate between the two. And uh, as you see in this image by the artist Neil Haig, what the system does is it puts its institutional front people at the entrance to the left side of the brain and says, no, no, no right brain influence here. Thank you very much. And it's all systematic because at the 
the core of the cult, as I call it, the global cult. They know how all this works. And um, interestingly, we, we think of neurons firing and making things happen, but there are an enormous amount of neurons in the brain that are there to do the opposite not to facilitate firing and activity, but to inhibit it. They're actually called inhibitory neurons. And this week I've been watching a, a fascinating um, interview with a man called Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who has studied these hemispheres uh, for a very long time. He's uh, written a book called The uh, Master and His Emissary and the Making of Western Society. And he's talking about the left brain being the maker of Western society. Actually, it's a much larger global society, increasingly, that is imprisoned in the left side of the brain. And McGilchrist has pointed out that around half the time, this bridge between the two hemispheres of the brain is not facilitating communication between the two, whole brain, but inhibiting it. He also points out that primates have more inhibitory neurons than any other mammal, and humans have more inhibitory neurons than any other primate. And I'm sure there is a good and, and sometimes positive reason for why that is so. But if we think about it, how effective that would be in closing minds and shutting down perception, if you could manipulate these inhibitory neurons to block information processing into a wider perception and stop people expanding into the panorama to see how the dots connect. So this is Ian McGilchrist, a psychiatrist, talking about this left-right brain phenomenon. The left hemisphere has this very narrow beam, perhaps three degrees out of the 360, targeted on a detail you can see very precisely. It fixes it and it grabs it. And it, the left hemisphere controls the right hand with which most of us do the grabbing and the getting. Whereas the right hemisphere has this broad, open, sustained, vigilant attention, which is on the lookout for everything else without preconception. So on the one hand, you've got an attention that produces a world of tiny fragments that don't seem connected to one another, a bit here, a bit there, a bit elsewhere, that are decontextualized, that are um, disembodied, abstract, become examples of a category of things and are fixed by the stare of the left hemisphere. So you've got these static, fixed, known, familiar bits and pieces. Oh, it's one of those, that's what I eat. Oh, it's one of those, and so on. Whereas with the right hemisphere, we see that nothing really is completely separated from everything else or indeed from anything else, ultimately. That all is at some level seamlessly interconnected, that it's flowing and changing rather than fixed and static, that everything is what it is because of the context it finds itself in, that embodiment is essential to the nature of what we're looking at, both our looking and the thing we're looking at, um, that there are unique individuals, that it's not just person, but it's Sue or Fred or whatever it is. Um, those distinctions, the uniqueness, is something the right hemisphere sees. But the left hemisphere sees just an example of something it uses and needs. You can see why human society is as we experience it. 
when you see the perception, thus the behavior that follows, that comes from the domination of the left side of the brain. And that includes the whole medical profession in totality, if not every individual. And the scientists and the academics and all these people, they are locked away in the left side of the brain. And so are politicians, massively, overwhelmingly. So they're seeing a, a myopic world and they're seeing nothing about how everything actually connects. And this is the other thing. When you look at how the world's controlled, well, what are you looking at? You're looking at bureaucrats, bureaucracy. You're looking at rules and regulations and laws and, oh, no, in triplicate. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll write it down and then we'll write it down. Oh, you've broken this law, law, you know, yeah. Rules, regulations. You can't. It's more than my job's worth. That's all the left side of the brain. Ian McGilchrist again. You see, because we so idolize rules and procedures, we think if there aren't rules and procedures for something, then it can't really be real. But all the really real things are not susceptible to this proceduralization. I was just having a conversation with a young man who's studying at Durham at the moment. And uh, I, I, I just hinted in what we were saying that one of the problems with universities now, as with schools, as with the medical profession, um, and with the whole of life, is the sudden explosion of bureaucratic procedures and thinking. There are manuals and upon manuals that you're supposed to read and observe and follow. And then we're surprised that professionals who are skilled people who have learned things through experience want to leave the profession because they're effed off with the, the general tenor of the way in which they're treated by managers who've never been teachers or doctors or whatever. I mean, I had a very, very distinguished colleague who was a bit of a mentor of mine, the, the professor of neuropsychiatry at the Maudsley. And he was queried by a manager about why he'd sent a patient for a scan. And he said, when I have to explain to a manager why I have sent a patient to a scan, it's time for me to leave the profession. Another crucial trait of the left brain is not just the need, the desperation for certainty. It wants everything to be certain. What it thinks is certain. This is how it is. We know. There's no fluidity which the right brain provides that sees that maybe, just maybe, we don't know it all. And you know, when you think that our visual reality is a, it's, it's a narrow band of frequency that's so tiny, it's insane, called visible light. According to mainstream science, the electromagnetic spectrum, which is pretty much our experience reality, is 0.005% of what exists in the universe in terms of energy in all its forms. And visible light is a fraction of the 0.005%. Now, to think that you must be certain, you must have certainty within that ridiculously narrow band of even visual perception is ridiculous. But science and religion and all these other institutions, but those two, let's pick those two out. They appear to be different. So science says, oh, religion is just myth. But they both demand certainty. So religion says, this is how it is. It's in this book. This is how it is. And if you don't um, believe this, if you want to explore outside of that, 
right brain, then you're not one of us anymore. You're out of the group. You're a blasphemer at worst. And yet science, which kind of ridicules religion, also wants certainty. And the thing is that, that, that when you want certainty, any other information and possibility that might question your certainty, you are dismissing that even vehemently by reflex action. What do you mean there could be other possibilities and not only the one I believe in? No, can't be possible. You're interrupting my certainty. Um, so the left side of the brain wants certainty, and certainty is the great inhibitor of open-minded research and open-minded exploration to know more and more and more. And Ian McGilchrist was asked a question uh, during this interview. And the question and the answer say so much about why this world is as it is. Could we say, rather worry, worryingly, that we're living in a world where the very reasons for doubting are doubted and there is this crusade for certitude? Absolutely. And, and by the way, that is entirely part of the hypothesis I'm putting forward, because one of the first things that differentiates the hemispheres is the left hemisphere has to have certainty. There's a famous picture used by Wittgenstein, which is actually taken from a Victorian children's comic, which shows either a, a duck or a rabbit, depending on how you look at it. And the, the right hemisphere is able to hold those together without collapsing them. But the left hemisphere is unable to. It's like either this is a duck or it's a rabbit. What do you mean? And it's that's its attitude. It's cut and dried to everything. It's black and white thinking, dogma, cut and dried thinking, unnuanced thinking, the craving for certainty that lies behind our problems now. And that is exactly an expression of the left hemisphere's mode of being in this world, whereas the right hemisphere, I think I may have mentioned this, is the devil's advocate. It was so called by Ramachandran, a very great neuroscientist. It's the one that says, yeah, but maybe not. And if only we had more of that voice saying, yeah, but maybe not, let's have another look, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. Remember COVID? That period of intense demonization of anyone who was saying, yeah, but maybe not. Because the censorship, if you look at it, is not only censoring information that they don't want you to see, it's censoring information and opinion that is far more right brain generated. So you have the myopia view during the COVID period of the COVID story, load of nonsense, and this suppression and demonization of those right brain influenced people that were saying, well, I hear what you're saying, but I have some questions. And when they say, follow the science, what they're saying is follow the left side of the brain. Now, a guy who for me kind of personifies this mentality is a bloke called Richard Dawkins, he's a evolutionary biologist, apparently. I debated with him once at the Oxford Union Debating Society at Oxford University 
a lot of years ago now. And I have rarely, if ever in my life, met someone who was so closed-minded and thus so imprisoned in the left side of the brain. Dawkins wants certainty. And he's so certain that he's right that he dismisses by reflex action other possibilities that would unravel his certainty. So he was asked in this interview to provide a sentence that would make creationists rethink their beliefs. I'm not sure about a, about a sentence. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes. Compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, a uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. And the only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. Um, <laughs> More, moreover, the same thing works with, with every gene you do separately, and even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once, that once did something. I find it extremely hard to imagine how any creationist who actually bothered to listen to that could possibly doubt the fact of evolution. But they don't listen. I mean, there's, there's, your, your question is a, is a perfectly good question, but it's not, it's not really relevant because what they do is simply stick their fingers in their ear and say, la, la, la. They know what's true because it's in the holy book. And that, that even, I mean, the most extreme case is the geologist Kurt Wise, who has a PhD in geology from Harvard, and said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. A mind like that, it seems to me, is, well, a disgrace to the human species. Well, that, irony of ironies, was Richard Dawkins describing himself. What did he say? They don't listen. They put their fingers in their ears and go la la la. So does he. And he's like throughout science, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Sam Harris in the United States, same mentality. The body is a software program that dictates human behavior unless consciousness overrides it and intervenes and goes its own way. And what Dawkins is doing is mistaking this biological software program in the form of the genes that he's obsessed with. He's mistaking that for the origin of consciousness. And this is why he will dismiss any idea of life after death, because to him, body-centric, body-program-centric, when the body dies, well, so must consciousness. It must be over. Consciousness beyond the body is something he can't, accept. And he almost also uh, makes um, another, what I would say is an error, in that he's equating, because he's famous for his attacks on religion, 
he's equating the religious, like the Old Testament, God, the Bible, with this benevolent force that people call God. And thus, why would God do this? Why would God do that? Well, what if, and I suggest this is how it is, what if this God that created this body program, this double hemisphere brain, was not a benevolent force, but a very malevolent one that was focused only on human control, for reasons I explain in the books. In that case, to use Dawkins' words, um, that creator did deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. That's the whole point. That's what's going on. Because as consciousness is suppressed and the body program becomes dominant, people become more and more easy to control and less and less um, able to expand their minds into the panorama and out of the myopia. So our, our reality is actually a simulation. It's a simulated reality and the program running through the body connects us to the simulated reality, which is why we see the world as it is when actually it's nothing like that. If you go deeper into it as things like quantum physics have long understood. So are we then at the mercy of the body program? Well, yes, but only if consciousness does not override the program, which it can. It's where the mavericks come from. So how do you do that? Well, you open your mind, literally. If you look at closed-minded people, they are left brain prisoners. When you look at more expansive people that see the greater picture, they are overwhelmingly influenced by the right side of the brain. But how does that work? Consciousness and the hemispheres of the brain. Well, if your consciousness can be manipulated to see the world in myopic terms, then which side of the brain is going to be dominant in processing that, processing that information? Well, the left side is. So consciousness and which side of the brain dominates or whether we're a whole brain people are fundamentally interrelated. If you can get people to close their mind, close their consciousness, then the left brain will be dominant. If you can get people to open their minds and see that actually everything is one, everything does connect, then they're going to be far more influenced by the right side of the brain. And as I hope I've kind of indicated in this video, which of the hemispheres dominates, completely dictates the world that we live in. And if we can balance the two, well, that is what they call, I guess, utopia, certainly compared with what we have now.